Καλησπέρα φίλοι μας. Ελληνίδες και Έλληνες. Ελληνιδάρες και Ελληνές μας. Ένα καλό βράδυ να έχετε όλοι. Σας αρέσει η μουσική. Πιστεύω να σας αρέσει και το επόμενο. Να πείστε αυτή την εκπομπή. Και στην κατεβάσουν. Άμα την κατεβάσουν, η αλήθεια θα έχει μαθευτεί. Εγώ θα έλεγα να βάλετε και ζώνη ασφαλείας. Αγαπητέ φίλε και φίλοι, γεια σα και πάλι καλησπέρα, καλησπέρα σε όλο τον κόσμο. Κοινοποιήστε αυτή την εκπομπή παντού. Μα έλεγαν όλοι ότι το θυμάστε, ότι είναι ασφαλέ και αποτελεσματικό. Βέβαια, υπάρχει πάντα μια δεύτερη γνώμη, έτσι δεν είναι. Μια δεύτερη γνώμη, η οποία ρίχνει φω στου τραυματισμού και το πένθο από το εμβόλιο. COVID-OU, αλλά ρίχνει επίση και μια περιεκτική ματιά στις συστημικές ανεπάρκειες που φαίνεται να τους επέτρεψαν. Εδώ εξετάζουμε την κορυφαία ανάλυση των φαρμακευτικών δοκιμών, το ρόλο του MHRA στη, διαρύθμι... στη ρύθμιση αυτών των προϊόντων, το ρόλο των επιστημόνων συμπεριφορά του SAGE στον επηρεασμό, προσέχτε τη λέξη SAGE, στον επηρεασμό της πολιτικής και το ρόλο των μέσων ενημέρωσης και των εταιριών μεγάλης τεχνολογίας στην καταστολή, Τη ελεύθερη και ανοιχτή συζήτηση για το θέμα. Ευχαριστούμε την Oracle Films. Ήταν μια παραγωγή σε συνεργασία με τον Mark Sarkman, πρώην στέλεχο τη ITV και BSKB και News Uncut και είναι ένα αυτοχρηματοδοτούμενο τηλεοπτικό πρόγραμμα διάρκεια μία ώρα, διαμορφωμένο ταυτόχρονα και για διαφημιστικά διαλύματα. Κάναμε την καλύτερη δυνατή προσπάθεια να μπορέσουμε να το μεταφράσουμε στα ελληνικά. Γιατί πιστεύουμε ότι όλοι οι Έλληνες πρέπει να γνωρίζουν. 
να έχετε μια καλή ακρόαση, να μην το βάλετε ποτέ κάτω. Να είμαστε όλοι μια δύναμη. Για να μην το βάλουμε ποτέ κάτω. Για να ξέρουμε ότι για ένα πράγμα είναι ότι δεν τους κάνουμε ποτέ τη χάρη. Καλή ακρόαση σε όλο τον κόσμο. Your safety will always come first and a COVID-19 vaccine will only be approved by us, the UK's Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, once it has met robust standards on safety, quality and effectiveness. I was vaccinated because I'm a carer. I've had all three and I have the flu one as well. As far as the government is concerned, I believe they are doing the best thing for the nation. I've got an eight-year-old and I just didn't want to catch it where I didn't have to, to be fair. If this was going to prevent me from having it, then it was all good for me. I wanted to go on holiday. I just thought it was better that I get it done. I wanted to protect other people. The COVID vaccine has been hailed as a medical and logistical success. It's claimed that millions of lives have been saved, but there's growing evidence that the jab can have devastating consequences. They actually told my wife and two children that they had no hope and if I did survive, it would be from the waist up. I thought I was going to die. I would go to bed at night not thinking I was going to wake up. Those injured by the vaccine feel unrecognised and abandoned by the NHS and a government they trusted. You take one for the team, so I, I took the vaccine, but now the team's run in the opposite direction. Just let people know that when it goes wrong, there's like no help at all. The doctors don't know what to do with us. We're literally keeping each other alive. Safety is our watchword, and we are globally recognised for requiring the highest standards of safety, quality and effectiveness for any vaccine. Having been double jabbed and being one of the first to take the Pfizer vaccine, I have, after several months, critically appraising the data, speaking to eminent scientists in Oxford, Stanford and Harvard, speaking to two investigative medical journalists and being contacted by two Pfizer whistleblowers, reluctantly concluded that this vaccine is not completely safe and has unprecedented harms, which leads me to conclude that it needs to be suspended until all the raw data has been released for independent analysis. Dr. Malhotra is a respected and influential figure in medicine, and he's not alone in calling for the suspension of COVID vaccines. Many more international scientists are alarmed at what's developing into a global issue. I'm John Bowe, and I'm going to shine a light on an issue that cannot be ignored. Millions of COVID vaccine injuries and thousands of deaths are being reported through official channels all across the world. Our government has been accused of covering up the emerging data and the media of telling only one side of the story. We'll look at how and why. But first and foremost, we give the vaccine injured a voice. My mum was standing on the drive. Um, she'd been looking after the dogs while we'd been away. And she was talking to the neighbour. And... Um, I remember getting out of the car. And I burst into tears and I said, please don't be alarmed at how I'm walking. Um... And it was then I really realised, I think after the tremors on the Sunday, that there was something seriously wrong. And I'd been fine up until, like, I'd been healthy, perfectly fine up until um, the point of me having my second vaccine. Breathe, breathe, breathe. Breathe, 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 breathe. OK, come on. Hello, everyone.
Um, it's really funny because I look at these videos and I watch them and I either get really emotional watching them or I just go, wow, look at how far I've come and look at where I was. Um, I was on a Zimmer frame. I was in a wheelchair. Um, I kind of feel like I'm looking at somebody else sometimes. And not me. I still suffer now. I suffer with a lot of fainting. I suffer with my legs giving way. As a result of um, the damage that the vaccine has done to me, I've ended up registered disabled. Before I took the vaccine, I was a 57 or 56 year old scaffolder. Absolutely no underlying health conditions. I worked hard, five tonne of steel a day, never been ill. I had a very active private life. I was in a band. Uh, I left the band about a year ago, but I still went to about four or five gigs a week. And nothing now. I don't do any of that anymore. Trying to get into places is not easy, either on a wheelchair or on crutches. The prosthetic leg isn't is great when it works. I'm still very early, so it's not working the way it should to a certain extent. The doctors actually said that the clots that were in my system were enough that it should have been fatal. I've lost my left leg. I'm lucky that I've lost my left leg. I should have been both legs. I'm now going blind in my right eye. Thanks, AstraZeneca. It's a gift that keeps on giving. That's the honest answer. <laughs> My husband was 32. He was due to start a job at Great Ormond Street Hospital um, as a senior clinical psychologist. I remember him uh, coming home and saying that he'd, he'd been offered AstraZeneca and he was really, really excited, really proud that it was a British one. He was funny, he was kind, he was generous. He, he did everything. Um, you know, he worked two jobs and still came home and helped with the children. Um, even that day, he helped put the kids to bed, uh, you know, when he was having a stroke. He's m just my best friend. The last time I saw him was, was walking towards the ambulance. Um, I, I must have known on some level that that might have been the last time that I was going to see him. For months, this doctor's widow was forced to use the local food bank because she was living on benefits. She's finally received government compensation and she accepts it as some vindication. But, she says, it's not enough. It will never be enough. Charlotte is still awaiting an inquest, but across the UK, coroners have confirmed deaths from the vaccine. Are usually framed as very rare. But how rare? Adverse reactions should be reported to the yellow card scheme operated by the MHRA, the UK's Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency. Their figures to August the 24th show over 430,000 reported reactions, of which 2,240 were fatal. America's VAERS system has almost one and a half million reports with over 30,000 deaths. Not all these reports will be confirmed as vaccine-induced, but then again, not all reactions are reported. The figures surely demand investigation. Οι οποίες τώρα έχουν γίνει πάνω από ένα εκατομμύριο διακόσες φιλιάδες Can deny that there has been harm. You can argue about how much, but you can't deny that there has been harm. Thank you. 
It's just a scandal of such epic proportions that I think people don't know where to begin with it. It's, it's, it's frightening to even approach it. The government is in denial on vaccine injuries, according to one of its own MPs. Other jurisdictions have taken the view that fully compensating those who do the right thing for public health reasons by having a vaccine should be looked after by the state if the consequences of having that vaccine result in disability or injury. This approach is taken in order to promote vaccine confidence amongst those who might otherwise be hesitant about having a vaccine. This government's approach, however, seems to be to try and promote vaccine confidence by covering up the adverse consequences for some of having been vaccinated. Sir Christopher is pursuing a private member's bill, trying to speed up compensation and increase the maximum amount from £120,000. But for the vaccine injured, recognition and a return to good health are paramount. Take Caroline Pova. She runs a pickling business, writes books, and is a public speaker. For 10 years, she supported a village in Japan, which was devastated by the tsunami. And to make her annual visit, she took the jab. My life has completely changed now. It's not, it's... It's, it's unrecognizable compared to how it was. Sorry. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> for about five months, I did hardly anything. I couldn't function at all. I was exhausted constantly. I was in constant pain. Head and eye pain was relentless. I couldn't function. I couldn't walk very far. Uh, I couldn't read things. And I'm, I do a lot of... I write as well as running my business. <laughs> So I couldn't write anything. I had trouble processing information. So I couldn't work in my business because I couldn't follow the recipes. Um, and I didn't have any physical strength. I've now, I got to the stage where I can function at about 30% of how I could function before the vaccine. On a good day, I can maybe do a couple of hours in the kitchen, but then after a while, I have such chest pain that I have to come and lie down in here. And I, I used to do 12 hours on my feet working in there. It's not about money. It's about having a sense of purpose with your day, isn't it? Jobs and work is for all of us. And if you can't do those things, you do get to the point where you think, I cannot live like this. Life is no longer worth living. And we have lost people in the vaccine injured community to suicide. Yeah, I, I didn't, didn't want to live when it was at its worst. I just couldn't, I couldn't see the point. These vaccines were tested thoroughly for safety and effectiveness at every stage of the development and manufacturing process. They are also continually being monitored. Now they are being used in the wider population. This means we can be confident that the vaccines are safe and highly effective. Safe and effective? Would millions have been so confident if they'd known how different these gene therapies were? The word vaccine may have served as a reassurance, but by no traditional definition were these vaccines. The definition in the authorities are using is not what people understand the word vaccine to mean. The public's perception of a vaccine is, you know, we're thinking about polio and about measles and the conventional vaccines, where you have a very inert part of the virus being used and it prevents the illness. These, these what we're using now is a different technology, it's new and it doesn't prevent the illness. Although it's not my traditional area of expertise, my understanding looking at the data of the mechanism of harm from the vaccine is that the spike protein, which we believed initially to just be localized to the arm, appears to be distributed throughout the body uh, in every major organ system for several months, causing either a direct reaction through toxicity or an autoimmune reaction. And that is the most likely explanation behind the mechanism of harm from the mRNA products. Development of the jabs was done at warp speed, so much so that governments had to indemnify the drug companies against any future injury claims and invest billions up front. They knew they were taking risks. 
as I understand it then from what you're saying is that it may be that there needs to be some compromise in some of the the safety measures that may, would normally be expected to create a vaccine because time is so crucial. Well, of course, if you if you want to wait and see if a side effect shows up two years later, uh, that takes two years. When vaccine efficacy was declared at 95%, relieved governments gave the green light. But Dr. Malhotra argues that the methodology was flawed. Relative risk reduction is uh, a way of exaggerating the benefits of any intervention, clearly which would be in the interests of people trying to sell you something, in this case, the pharmaceutical industry. So if, for example, you have a thousand people in a trial that didn't have the vaccine versus a uh, thousand people that did, in the placebo group, in the dummy group, you may have two people dying. And in the intervention group, you may have just one person dying. And that's a reduction of 50%. One over two is a 50% relative risk reduction. But actually, you've only saved one life out of a thousand. So the absolute risk reduction is only one in a thousand. It's a big difference. The guidance has been for many years that we must always use absolute risk reduction in conversations with patients, not just relative risk, risk reduction alone. Uh, otherwise, it's considered unethical. The accusation is that governments acted on Pfizer's relative risk figure of 95% efficacy when the absolute risk was a mere 0.84%. In other words, you'd have to vaccinate 119 people to prevent just one from catching COVID. So we were basically sold on something that ultimately, in, on retrospect, in retrospect now, was very, very misleading. Red flags should have been raised when the FDA locked away Pfizer's trial data for 75 years while the vaccines were being rolled out. A U.S. court finally ordered their release, and the initial disclosures are alarming. Alexandra Latipova is one of a group of experts who studied the documents. Among her shocking allegations are these. Pfizer skipped major categories of safety testing altogether. The toxicity of the COVID-19 vaccine's mRNA active ingredient was never studied. The FDA and Pfizer knew about major toxicities associated with gene therapy class of medicines. The CDC, FDA, and Pfizer lied about vaccine stain in the injection site. My examination of leaked Moderna documents also revealed that vaccine-induced antibody-enhanced disease was identified as a serious risk. AstraZeneca also met with controversy. In March 2021, its use was temporarily halted in several European countries because of fears of blood clots. In the UK, it is now not recommended for anyone under 40. We asked the DHSC whether they were aware of allegations of inadequate and possibly flawed trial data. This is not something that DHSC will be responding to. The pharmaceutical companies have also been reluctant to comment. Scientists prefer to emphasize the 20 million lives they claim to have been saved. So the suggestion that the vaccine has saved 20 million lives is really, I think, science fiction, not scientific fact, because the study that comes from is a very poor quality observational study. Um, and when you look at a higher quality level of evidence, in fact, even Pfizer's own randomized control trial didn't show any reduction in COVID mortality of statistical significance. It showed no reduction or cause mortality. So this really, this statement is almost implausible. Um, to be honest, it sounds more like an advert from the drug industry than true science. With so many questions about the benefits and safety of the vaccines, why were they authorized so quickly by the MHRA? And what exactly is the relationship between the regulators and the companies they regulate? A recent article in the British Medical Journal questioned their independence. The MHRA chief executive, June Rain, insists that safety and independence are vital. But this year, she admitted that the agency had changed from watchdog to enabler. Rules are written on tablets of stone, and there's a lot of policemen in these places that go around factories, find problems with trials, and generally hold things up. We tore up the rule book and we allowed companies to immediately start 
juxtaposing not sequential phases of clinical trials, but overlapping, beginning the next one before the previous had been finished. Doctors, patients and members of the public must be aware that regulators cannot be trusted to be independent as long as they continue to be captured by industry. You know, recent evidence that's emerged from a BMJ investigation revealed that 86% of the funding of the MHRA comes from the drug industry. And that's a huge conflict of interest. We asked the MHRA for their observations, but they merely referred us to their official guidance on the safety of COVID vaccines. What was happening with informed consent was hugely concerning. I think what concerned me the most were doctors who weren't informing themselves. They've been very busy and they haven't done their own research. They've just accepted everything that they're told. A government guideline comes and we've seemed to have disrupted the doctor-patient relationship. There were many, many doctors who were getting all of their information from the BBC on the, in their lunch breaks and who accepted at face value because of the word vaccine that these were going to be safe and effective. That was a real dereliction of duty. I think the lack of acknowledgement of vaccine injuries being a, a major issue is rooted in willful blindness. Specifically, human beings turned a blind eye to feel safe, avoid conflict, reduce anxiety, and to protect prestige. The General Medical Council responded, it is not within the remit or expertise of the GMC to assess the scientific or evidential basis for the recommendation made by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation or the decisions made by government and public health bodies. But we do regularly share and discuss our guidance and its application with government health officials and other relevant stakeholders. We expect doctors to follow the principles in our guidance and use their judgment about how to apply these in the circumstances of the pandemic. Later, why did the government continue driving the vaccine campaign when scientists had learned it didn't prevent infection, it didn't prevent transmission? And statistics show the vast majority of the population was never at risk from serious illness. And Dr. Jones, a consultant paediatrician who's always been pro-vaccination, has this stark warning. The children are at low risk, they don't need this vaccine, and the harms are real. Hi folks, I'm here at St. Thomas's where I've just had my first AstraZeneca vaccine and uh, quite literally I did not feel the thing and I cannot stress how important it is for everybody to get their vaccination. Get your jab when you're asked to do so. It, it's good for you, it's good for your family, and it's, it's a great thing for the whole country. So please get your jab. Thanks very much. Can I ask, why did you get vaccinated? Um, to minimize the threat of COVID on everybody and myself. Well, to try and stop me dying from COVID-19 was a pretty big one. That and I wanted to go on holiday. Why did I get vaccinated? Because I didn't want the COVID, <laughs> but I still got it anyway. I was ill all over Christmas and I don't know quite what it was, but they said it's not COVID, it was something to do with COVID. But I know that I could have quite easily have called an ambulance, I was that ill. Were you told about any potential side effects from the vaccine? Um, no, and when I did ask, especially about reproductive um, issues that it may cause in the future. Nobody really gave me any answers. And the other thing is after I've had my vaccinations, I noticed some changes. To be fair, I don't feel that we was given um, enough information, but because it was such a big outburst, it kind of scared me to having it done and I've had it done. And luckily I haven't had any bad repercussions from it. Millions of people took the COVID jabs without serious side effects. But for those who did suffer, the physical pain and debility is made even worse by the frustration and mental stress of being ignored. They feel neglected by the NHS, misunderstood by the public, and betrayed by the government. Before I was fat and healthy, and used to do boxing, uh, we'd do crossfit, you know, do a lot of weights, weight training and 
you know, keep myself in good shape. When I had my Pfizer booster, that's when my world just totally crumbled. I remember one time grabbing on to me said, Dolly's in room. She's not going to die. I couldn't even get to the toilet. He was so frightened. His body was shaking, it was jerking. It was horrendous. Absolutely horrendous. My heart got elevated when I was on standing. I got really sick. I was um, being sick for six weeks. I was retching, being sick and throwing up every single day. My heart cramped. It felt like somebody had grabbed my heart and twisted it three times. I had brain fog. I developed a slur. I'd, I would slur my words and I developed a stammer. I had seizures. I can't, my body can't regulate temperature anymore. Um, it's totally my life. <laughs> my life, is, this is my life now. Stuck in my bed every day. With no help from anybody. It's not a real life form, it's an existence, and nobody. I tell you, if I could hold a Boris Johnson, I would tell Boris Johnson exactly what I think of him. Help these kids, help them. Help these people that are injured. But I can't live like this. I can't, I can't. I can't live my life in my bed. I'm only 36 years of age. I'm supposed to be getting married this year. I thought I was going to die. I would go to bed at night not thinking I was going to wake up because of how much pain my heart was in and the fact I, I couldn't breathe. AG, Max and Casey Harrison, congratulations. We were ranked number six in, in the entire world for uh, amateur ballroom and Latin dancing and the 10 dance um, championship. And we were one of the highest ranking couples in the UK and subsequently the world. Our ambition is to become world professional 10 dance champions, European, international and British professional champions. And we aim to do that within the next eight years. So I got my, my second jab and for the first two to three days, completely normal, I was dancing, I was preparing for the world championships. So this is, you know, I'm going to the gym every day and practicing. After the fourth and fifth, I started getting a small pain in my heart and I thought it was just genuine heartburn. I was still dancing um, and I'm told now that that could have been very dangerous and caused long-term health problems because of what could have happened. Originally it was pericarditis and I was then told just before Christmas actually it's perimyocarditis. So it's actually worse because I've got you know, pericarditis and the myocarditis damage. So I have scarring on three parts of my heart and still the lining and muscle of my heart has got the inflammation which constricts it. So that's when my heart rate goes up that's what's constricting my heart and stopping me from breathing. You know, I don't trust myself, I don't trust my body. You know, I, don't, I don't know what my heart's doing. You know, I can have a small pain now and, and 10 seconds I'm gonna be on the floor. You know, that's just the consequences of what's happened. The music's a very uh, beautiful and powerful thing if you understand it and if you enjoy it. And just to be able to go onto the floor and do what I think I was born to do in front of thousands of people, that was, it's the most special thing in the world. Uh, and you know, having lost that, um, I can't even begin to tell you how, how bad it feels. We're at Port Hales Bays with experienced Mallorca and we're about to jump off this cliff. I used to be in the Olympic team for synchronized swimming. I used to train six days a week, 10 hours a day. Um, incredibly hyperactive. I was also always known as the person that was like running around set, doing stupid things, backflips when I shouldn't be doing them and stuff like that. I'd go out and party and dance with my friends and then I'd be back home at 7 a.m. and then shooting a commercial at 
10 a.m. <laughs> so really pushing my limits. The industry required me to have, be double vaccinated to work on films and I immediately regretted it as soon as she put it in my arm. I just thought, well, what, what have I done? Over that period of two weeks, I just got worse and worse and worse and worse. And eventually this awful headache that um, was like someone was inside my, actually inside my skull, like pushing out. I can't explain how awful it was. And it was, I was dizzy. I was literally crawling, like, I, I really thought my life was over because I couldn't even, I couldn't even cook for myself. I couldn't even stand up. I couldn't care for myself. My mum would come and see me, I think like twice a week to change my bed sheets for me, do a food shop for me, clean my house for me. I just couldn't do anything at all. But I just thought this isn't living. If my life, mess of my life is going to be like this, then there's, then I would rather not be here. But it was in the sense of desperation for help, and I wouldn't have had those feelings. I wouldn't, my mind wouldn't have gone there if I had literally, if someone had just said, "I see you. I'm going to help you." Those who were in perfect health before their vaccine have encountered too much ignorance and skepticism when seeking medical help. For some. Their GPs have refused to engage, and that has reached the extent that they are made to feel gaslighted, Madam Deputy Speaker, with their physical pain being dismissed or explained away as mental illness. How insulting and humiliating is that, and how at odds with the principles of the National Health Service? It was the most terrifying, terrifying experience to be told that what's going on with you is psychological and that it's not physical when you're in physical pain. Genevieve and many of her fellow vaccine injured have spent thousands of pounds seeking treatments. They'll try anything to help ease their pain and disabilities. I found a private phlebotomy service and she comes to the house and, uh, and she takes a pint of blood out and literally sit here, she takes a pint of blood out and I come alive again and I'm me again. I can talk properly, I can move properly, my body feels different, everything feels different. I did a series of auction therapy treatments with Janie at the wellness lab. I'd come into the auction therapy and I'd have a migraine and I'd leave without one and feeling like so much better. I'm very fortunate in the fact that I'm 70% recovered. I'm back working, just pacing myself, but there's no such thing as autopilot. There's no such thing as easy. For John Watt, just making the journey for treatment is a trial. Like many of his fellow sufferers, he has POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. A walk of just 20 meters is enough to send his heart rate soaring. So it's in 134, 135. I can only stand for three minutes, five minutes, and then I start to black out, you know? So that's why I'm always having to lie down in that as well. He's trying a course of treatment called Goldick, where blood is taken from the arm, infused with gold particles, and then spun to remove the reactive cells. We had to be, we were out tens of thousands. My husband and I were getting ready to remortgage your house to get more treatment for him. He said, every single treatment we can possibly give him to get him better. It's important to note that John suffered a heart attack before getting any of his jabs. But he was back in the gym and back to health, taking his first two jabs without problems. It was after the Pfizer booster that he collapsed. In regards to people getting their vaccine, that's their choice. I've never told anyone not to get their vaccine. But... Just to let people know that when it goes wrong, there's like no help at all. And I'm being serious, like you don't have any help at all. They'll use your mental health against you. Georgia Siegel also paid for private Goldick treatment and had some encouraging results. 
Although the treatment that I've had has helped me dramatically and significantly and given me back a certain quality of life, it's not the quality of life I had before I had the vaccine. None of these treatments guarantee a cure. And the tragedy is that for most healthy people under the age of 70, there's very low risk from COVID-19. The benefits of vaccination are questionable. One thing that's become very clear now is that the vaccine doesn't prevent transmission. And in fact, has very li limited efficacy, if any, in preventing infection. Therefore, it becomes an issue of individual choice. And certainly, when you look at age groups that are under 70, the harms clearly seem to outweigh the benefits for most people. This chart reflects deaths of people with COVID up to May 2022. And the numbers increase dramatically as the age groups rise. The vast majority are over 70 years old, and especially over 80. We asked the DHSC why the vaccine campaign targeted all age groups and whether it accepted that the vaccines were not preventing infection or transmission. This is not something that DHSC will be responding to. Let's now look at the data after the vaccinations began. These are deaths from any cause amongst 15 to 44 year olds in England and Wales. There is a notable increase in 2021, the year of vaccination, higher even than 2020 when COVID emerged. Young men seem particularly prone to myocarditis, inflammation of the heart. This data from America shows the expected rate of myocarditis in blue against actual cases in yellow within seven days of a vaccine. Note the increase in younger age groups, particularly 18 to 24s. It's hard to ignore reports of sudden deaths and collapses, in particular on the sports field. It's just been unbelievable how many people, not just footballers, sports people in general, you know, you've had tennis players, you've had uh, cricketers, basketball, just how many are just keeling over. And at some point, surely you have to say, this isn't right, this needs to be investigated, you know? And it might turn out that it's because they've had COVID and this is what COVID has perhaps done to their hearts. It might be that the vaccines are causing these problems, but we need to find out why. Why in 2022 are many more people than usual dying, as confirmed by the Office of National Statistics? For instance, deaths are up 11.7% in 10 to 14 year olds and almost 15% in the 55 to 59 age group. Overall, that could equate to over 75,000 excess deaths in England and Wales this year, and not from COVID. The Daily Telegraph is reporting that deaths in the aftermath of lockdown could be greater than COVID itself. There are calls for an investigation, mentioning lack of health care, stress, long COVID, even the cost of living. Why on earth isn't COVID vaccination under suspicion when there are so many reports of adverse reactions here and around the world? It beggars belief. And yet, when there are so many questions on the efficacy and safety of COVID injections, the government still pushes ahead with a program of immunization. And for children, Last April, the NHS began a rollout of jabs for those aged between 5 and 11. Letters of information were distributed to parents across the nation. And in South East London, the NHS went further still, sending bright, smiley envelopes directly to the children. Inside, there was a packet of sunflower seeds to, quote, bring some joy and sunshine into children's lives. Directly below, the vaccination message, quote, to give them the best protection. It all marked a major U-turn in policy. The likelihood of children having um, significant uh, uh, detriment or if they catch COVID-19 is very, very low. Uh, so this is an adult vaccine for the adult population. Nevertheless, this summer, the NHS added COVID-19 to the regular vaccination schedule for five to 15 year olds even though the government does not recommend Pfizer for under-12s and AstraZeneca for under-40s. 
It was a move that prompted 78 leading professors, doctors and analysts to write this to the MHRA. We strongly challenge the addition of COVID-19 vaccination into the routine child immunisation programme despite no demonstrated clinical need, known and unknown risks and the fact that these vaccines still only have conditional marketing authorisation. I'm so deeply concerned at the lack of balance and the risk of harm that is... And that's really why I've been speaking out. I feel I have a, a moral obligation, an ethical obligation to at least let as many parents as possible know that they don't need to get their children vaccinated. This is not necessary. The children are at low risk, they don't need this vaccine, and the harms are real. Now, government advice seems to have changed yet again. From September the 1st, children who turn five can only get a first and second dose of COVID-19 vaccination if they are either at high risk due to a health condition or living with someone with a weakened immune system. And it appears that children aged between 12 and 15 can only be boosted if they too are at high risk. So, if the jabs really are safe and effective, why are they now being limited? We asked about the changes. This is not something that DHSC will be responding to. If some of the contents of this program have surprised you, in our final part, we'll show you how and why the mainstream media only told you one side of the story and how the government used psychological techniques to nudge the nation into compliance. Do you come in? It's going to be good. Come on, mate. Come on, let's go. Don't miss out on your two COVID jabs. Don't miss out on the good times. When they went for their jabs, they thought they were doing the right thing in following government instructions. They might even have lined up behind you. And yet the government, the NHS, the media, all those who encouraged vaccine take-up, they've all backed away. So people have had to help themselves through groups like UKCV Family, VIB UK and others. My charity organization for the vaccine injured has created a call center to support people. The indifference that we've all experienced is unnecessary and cruel. We want to support each other. That's the main thing our group is doing, is supporting each other, because we've got no one else to talk to. The doctors don't know what to do with us. Nobody else really knows what to do, so we're just trying to help each other. On a weekly basis, I get told that someone is suicidal. Um, Caroline and I have both had to call the police before because we've found a online suicide note. We have frequently found ourselves in regular contact with somebody, private messaging, saying someone who's, who's literally on the edge at that moment. And these support groups are keeping people alive. We get um, abuse from both sides. We're kind of stuck right in the middle. There are people who are very pro-vaccine who hate you. There are people who are very against this vaccine, if not all vaccines, they hate you too, all for different reasons. This is the feeling that you get from people in the, in, and you're stuck in the middle. And that's a very, very lonely place to be. The plight of the vaccine injured will be on the agenda when Baroness Heather Hallett finally holds her COVID inquiry. But she must also investigate SAGE, the government's scientific advisory group, and especially their so-called nudge unit otherwise known as Spy B. Why such a culture of fear? From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. Earlier on the very day of that historic Boris Johnson speech, Sage met to discuss Spy B's methods of achieving behavioral change. The tactics were agreed. The influence is clear. The coronavirus is the biggest threat this country has faced for decades, and this country is not alone. All over the world, we're seeing the devastating impact of this invisible killer. And though huge numbers are complying, and I thank you all, the time has now come for us all to do more. You should not be meeting friends. If your friends ask you to meet, you should say no. You should not be meeting family members who do not live in your home. You should not be going shopping except for essentials like food 
and medicine. And you should do this as little as you can. If you don't follow the rules, the police will have the powers to enforce them, including through fines and dispersing gatherings. The way ahead is hard, and it is still true that many lives will sadly be lost. This is an important update from the government about coronavirus. Someone on your street, at your supermarket, or in your park is highly likely to have COVID-19. Do not go out unless absolutely necessary. Do not meet up with anyone outside your household. Do not put the lives of your loved ones in danger. This is a national health emergency. Around one in three people have no symptoms and are spreading it without knowing. Keep your distance. Exercise. Don't socialize. Stop the spread. Stick to the rules. If you bend the rules, people will die. I think what's important to understand is over the last two years, there has been the promotion of unethical psychological techniques to encourage behavioral change, such as the use of fear, um, artificially increasing the sense of being afraid in order to get people to change their behaviors. And so fear drove the lockdown. It was the strictest of peacetime regimes with untold damage to businesses, education, mental health and family life. In this atmosphere, deepened by fatality numbers which experts now tell us were inflated, the only way out, apparently, was vaccination. People have got to understand vaccination is going to be, in the end, your route to liberty. For the world at large, normalcy only returns when we've largely vaccinated the entire global population. And once vaccines were approved, the promotional campaign went into overdrive worldwide. Our fellow Americans, the science is clear. These vaccines will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. My name is Michael Kane. I've just had a vaccine for COVID. It's really important to know that the vaccines have all been through and met the necessary safety and quality standards. There's no evidence that it affects fertility. So roll up your sleeve. It's not just your own life you'll be saving, it's other people's lives too. Trust the science and get on with it. The vaccine rollout was a logistical triumph and may well have prevented hospital admissions and deaths. But when 9 million adults in the UK chose to remain jab-free, the nudge became a threat. No jab, no job. Vaccine passports and vilification of what were termed the anti-vaxxers. The nut jobs. The anti-vaxxers, dangerous obsessives. I don't want them sitting next to me in the theatre. I don't want them standing next to me at the theatre bar. I don't want them next to me or anywhere near me or even in the same carriage on the train. Frankly, if, if, if you're not vaccinated at the moment and you're, you're eligible and you've got no health reason for not being vaccinated, you're not just irresponsible. I mean, you're an idiot. When you use unethical psychology on a population, you actually start to see splits and divisions occurring. And that's really dangerous because you also encourage othering or the demonization of people. So we see that, that kind of not just fear being raised, but also anger being raised as well. They deserve to be punished. And I've told my friends this as well. In fact, I have blocked my friends who have said they're not getting a jab. They are dead wood in my eyes. Tens of thousands of people would not bow to the drive for mass vaccination. They demanded choice and they accused the mainstream media of promoting government propaganda. Let's return to the SAGE playbook. It says, use media to increase a sense of personal threat, a sense of responsibility to others and to promote positive messaging. Immediately, the regulator Ofcom asked broadcasters to take note of the significant potential harm that could be caused by material misleadingness in relation to the virus or public policy regarding it. They warned of taking appropriate regulatory action on any breaches. And note the date. It's the same day the SAGE document was approved and the Prime Minister spoke to the nation. Cue the BBC. Just to let yeah. you in on a journalistic point here, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. don't, as a matter of editorial policy, we don't debate with anti-vaxxers whether they're right yeah. or wrong. We actually don't yeah. do that. 
so the BBC doesn't engage with so-called anti-vaxxers, even when they may be right. And when several huge marches took place in London and across the UK, they were virtually ignored by the BBC and the rest of the media. These are the images they didn't want you to see. The story they didn't want you to know. Tens of thousands of citizens from all walks of life raising genuine concerns. The people the media painted as dangerous anti-vaxxers. And it just so happens that the government has spent an estimated half a billion pounds of public money for media advertising. Then there's the Trusted News Initiative, which the BBC says is an industry collaboration of major news and global tech organizations working together to stop the spread of disinformation. The partners include the BBC, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Twitter, and Microsoft. It sounds laudable, but what it really means is that governments, the media, and the big tech companies are working to a common script their script, their version of the truth. We asked the BBC what happened to free speech, balanced reporting and impartiality. I'm afraid we won't be commenting. The real truth is that anybody who questions the official narrative is generally suppressed and cancelled or labelled as a spreader of disinformation on social media. And that includes eminent scientists, doctors, and disgracefully, the vaccine injured. We have thousands of people on that support group all over the world who are vaccine injured. And we got shut down by Facebook. And I was quite shocked that that could happen. Your story is misinformation, you're anti-vaccine, um, you're anti-science. Um, you know, you're killing people. I've been told that. You're killing people telling your story. People won't take the vaccine if you tell your story. Please be quiet. This conspiracy of editorial control between mainstream and social media is stifling democratic discussion. A proper debate might have led to better informed choice on the vaccines and potentially fewer injuries. Instead, we've been subjected to psychological pressure under that dubious mantra, safe and effective. Proper, balanced science must come to a sound conclusion. We need to know the truth. for 
armor So make this a war to win Look in their eyes and tell them That I will always fight for you I will stand guard at the gate And I will not give up on you I will stop each shot they take Yes, I will always fight for you I will always fight for you Πληροφορία, ενημέρωση, γνώση, ίσον δύναμη. Σε μια εποχή που η λογική βρίσκεται υπό διωγμών, το διαδικτυακό κανάλι Social Media ORM Group και οι θηγατρικέ διαδικτυακέ του σελίδε πρωτοστατούν παρουσιάζοντα σε καθημερινή βάση επιστήμονε αλλά και ενεργού πολίτε τη διπλανή πόρτα στον αγώνα τη αμερόληπτη και με ήθο ενημέρωση κόντρα στην κατευθυνόμενη προπαγάνδα των συστημικών μέσων μαζική παραπληροφόρηση. Σα καλούμε να στηρίξετε την ανιδιωτελή μα προσπάθεια. Και η ελαχιστότατη συνδρομή σα είναι πολύτιμη για να μείνει αυτή η πατριωτική φωνή δυνατή. Social Media ORM Group. 